Hello, I'm Scott Davison, the Interim Dean of the Caldwell College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences at Moorhead State University. This is part of a series of Caldwell College Conversations featuring the expertise and interests of our faculty from the college to talk about contemporary and perennial issues of concern. Today we're talking about monuments and their history, especially the Civil War monuments, and how we respond to them today. Um, joining me is Dr. Julia Finch, who is Associate Professor of Art History here at Moorhead State, and Dr. Benjamin Fitzpatrick, Visiting Assistant Professor of History. Thank you for joining me, both, both of you, Julia and Ben. Thank you. Thanks. We're going to begin with Julia talking a little bit about uh, the nature of monuments and their history. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Julia now. Okay. All right, so I've got some images here that I'm going to walk through uh, as I give my little intro here. Um, so my introduction is a brief history of equestrian monuments from the ancient world to the present day. When we think of monuments and memorials, especially those connected to war, a few thoughts might come to mind. First, they're works of public art, often prominently located in town squares or on Main Street. For some of us, their prominent location means that we are forced to engage with them often, and they might evoke a strong response, as many works of public art do. Or maybe they're so ubiquitous that they simply blend with our surroundings and we accept their presence without question. Second, we might think of the material, bronze, the metal in which many sculptural and plaque memorials are cast. And finally, if we give any thought to figural monuments at all, we might want to know more about who is depicted and when and why the monument was created. I want to briefly walk you through some historical moments in monumental sculpture and then focus on post-Civil War monuments and contemporary artistic interventions. One of the earliest monuments of this familiar style takes us back to ancient Rome. The equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius defeating the Parthians in the east and Germanic tribes in the north. Although there were once many of these equestrian statues throughout Imperial Rome, this is the only pre-Christian one to survive. The statue remained on public view in Rome near the Lateran Palace through the Middle Ages and during the Renaissance was moved to a position of pride and prominence in Michelangelo's newly designed Piazza del Campidoglio. Although Michelangelo did not approve of its central location disrupting the geometry of the plaza, he did design a pedestal for it, creating the equestrian statue on plinth that we're familiar with today. So here we have the standard for the equestrian monument. What does it communicate to us? Power, authority, a regal command. Dressed in armor, we see a confident military leader. We are humbled before it, our size diminished. The bronze is solid and will last forever unless, as so often happened in Europe's history, it was melted down, often in the service of war to create new weapons. During the Renaissance, a crouching statue of a quote barbarian, now lost, was placed under the horse's leg, and the gesture of Marcus Aurelius could possibly be seen as one of clemency. But in effect, this gesture reinforces the authority of Rome over the barbarian, the righteousness of a civilized empire over the uncultured other. And as a side note to this statue, a copy that you see here was installed on the campus of Brown University in 1908, and students have recently created a group to have the statue removed due to the fact that it celebrates colonial violence and the myth of Western civilization. The equestrian statue gained popularity throughout Europe post-Renaissance. After an equestrian statue of Henry IV was installed in France in 1614, copies were installed throughout the kingdom. The statues were a sign of great cultural status and wealth, as well as the skill of the artist who had to sculpt the human form as well as the equine. And their connection to war is reinforced by the fact that their popularity faded after war horses were abandoned for war machines. The Civil War, in fact, was one of the last wars that was totally dependent on horsepower. So it is fitting that in a post-Civil War era of monument building between 1890 and 1950, we find both Confederate and Union generals on horseback in many American cities. The statue of John Hunt Morgan, for example, once located in downtown Lexington on course, Courthouse Lawn, commemorates a general of the Confederate Army. The format is an ancient one, a man in military dress astride a horse atop a plinth. The statue was dedicated in 1911 and remained in a, a very public place in downtown Lexington until its removal in October 2017, after a grassroots effort raised awareness of the aggression it perpetuated toward the African-American community. 
In October 2018, the statue was relocated to Lexington Cemetery, where Morgan is buried. A lot has happened since 2017. An alt-right protest of the removal of Confederate monuments and names from the city square of Charlottesville, Virginia, ended in the death of a woman who was hit by a car driven by one of the protesters. The deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and many other black and brown men and women at the hands of police and the Black Lives Matter protests that followed in the summer of 2020 focused new attention on the Confederate equestrian monuments and on Civil War monuments that celebrated the Union cause as well. The racial implications of a statue like the Emancipation Memorial sculpted by Thomas Bell, paid for by African Americans, and installed in Lincoln Park in Washington, D.C. in 1876 were called into question. In this statue, a seated Lincoln holds his hand above a crouching enslaved man who is still wearing chains. On the surface, this is a celebration of the emancipation of enslaved persons during the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. However, a fair critique of this statue was made by Frederick Douglass, who spoke at its unveiling on April 14, 1876, and expressed criticism about its design and its symbolism. According to a member of the audience, a historian from Howard University, Douglas said that the statue, quote, showed the Negro on his knees when a more manly attitude would have been indicative of freedom. In Richmond, Virginia in summer 2020, Black Lives Matter protesters gathered at the Robert E. Lee Memorial installed in 1890 and reclaimed the park below, spray painting words of black liberation on its plinth, creating striking images by projecting the face of George Floyd and others onto this Confederate monument. The Lee statue still stands, but the park beneath is now the site of community gardens, memorials to those killed by police violence, dance parties, and community food drives. In another high profile decision directly related to Black Lives Matter protests, the equestrian statue of Theodore Roosevelt was removed from the Museum of Natural History in New York in the summer of 2020, because as Mayor Bill de Blasio said, quote, it explicitly depicts black and indigenous people as subjugated and racially inferior. So what is the future of these monuments? Where should they go from here? Should we melt them down as the ancients did? Or is there another option? I want to leave you with a contemporary artistic invention in the in, intervention in the Civil War equestrian monument debate. And Kehinda Wiley's work, Rumors of War, challenges the symbolism of Confederate monuments. At 27 feet high and 16 feet wide, his sculpture of a young black man atop a horse is, according to Carew F. Daniels, quote, antithesis to the racist sculptures of Confederate generals and slave owners that the public has been forced to look at for years. Wiley himself said in the dedication of the work, which was first revealed in Times Square in December 2019, quote, I am a black man walking those streets. I'm looking up at those things that give me a sense of dread and fear. What does that feel like physically to walk a public space and to have your state, your country, your nation say, this is what we stand by? No, we want more. We demand more. Today we say yes to something that looks like us. Wiley's bronze sculpture is part of a series of work that embeds young black male bodies into famous works of art in the Western tradition. This subversive act reclaims the militaristic strength and authority afforded to white generals depicted in equestrian memorials from ancient Rome to Civil War America and celebrates the black body in public space. After its display in New York City, the work was, remo was moved to its permanent home in Richmond, Virginia, where it serves as a counterpoint to the Robert E. Lee monument there. Thank you, Julia. That was really fascinating. It's really helpful to see the history here to understand what contemporary pieces are doing and the conversations they're starting. Um, let's come back to this history, uh, but first we want to give Ben a chance here to tell us about some of the history of the, the Civil War and its aftermath. So I'm going to turn it over to Ben now. All right, let me bring up my uh, PowerPoint here. All right, can you everybody see that? Yes, good, thanks. All right, awesome. All right, 
So uh, my introduction is gonna be a little bit more narrower than uh, Dr. Finch's. I wanna talk about some of the Confederate monuments in Kentucky and my slides uh, have some examples of some of those uh, monuments that we, that we find. So as Dr. Finch pointed out, monumental sculptures have played an important role for centuries in shaping our collective memory. Considering this, the Confederate monument movement in Kentucky is a perfect example of how the adage, quote, the victors write history, end quote, is more complicated than it sounds. Even though Kentucky did not join the Confederacy, pro-Confederate Kentuckians snatched victory from the jaws of defeat by winning the war of public memory. Beginning almost immediately after the war, former Confederates and their sympathizers erected statues and monu monuments across the state. These monuments stood for more than just honoring Southern military prowess. They also performed political work, namely maintaining white supremacy. Undoubtedly, the Jefferson Davis Memorial pictured here and erected in 1924 in Davis's birthplace in Fairview, Kentucky, symbolized the Confederate identity of many white Kentuckians by the turn of the 20th century. However, Kentucky's affinity with the Confederacy did not exist at the start of the war. As its Southern sister states seceded, Kentucky declared neutrality. However, by September of 1861, after the Confederacy invaded Columbus, Kentucky, the General Assembly invited federal troops into the state. Kentucky's position as a border state, both geographically and politically, explains its unionist stance. Bordered by both the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, Kentucky has social and economic ties to the Midwest, as well as to the Lower South. Politically, most Kentuckians adhered to Henry Clay's Whig principles of nationalism, which included political compromise over the spread of slavery. And despite continuous Confederate overtures throughout the war for recruits, most Kentuckians remained either loyal to the Union or at least indifferent to the Confederacy. In the late 19th century, former Confederates and their sympathizers deployed the lost cause mythology to write a world which must have appeared turned upside down. In Kentucky, many communities and families had been divided by years of vicious guerrilla warfare, and most white Kentuckians feared a future that entailed black freedom. It's not surprising that the construction of the lost cause mythology began almost immediately with the erection of Confederate monuments. So this, for example, is the first Confederate uh, monument erected in Kentucky. It was erected by the Cynthiana Confederate Memorial Association in 1869. Uh, it's at Battle Grove Cemetery. Uh, and if you look, kind of look at uh, these Confederate monuments, this is kind of what they look like, this white marble uh, obelisk, or there's, you know, just a, kind of a, a Confederate soldier. In this image, uh, what you've got is the, the obelisk, and there's a Confederate flag draped on the top, and the, uh, the graves, gravestones around the, around the, around the uh, statue, those are Confederate soldiers. Uh, after the war, pro-Confederate re relief efforts and memorial activity received an abundance of sympathy and money from white Kentuckians. Women's organizations such as the Southern Relief Association and the United Daughters of the Confederacy were at the heart of fundraising efforts to erect monuments. In 1874, the Ladies Memorial and Monument Association of Lexington commissioned this monument. And this is interesting because this monument is to uh, Confederate uh, women. Uh, and it's in Lexington Cemetery, close to other graves of Confederate soldiers. And basically, it's kind of this mixture of militarism and uh, Christianity. You've got this, you know, wooden cross with a Confederate flag draped uh, over it. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but that's a broken flagpole or a broken uh, flag staff. And there's a, uh, a sword in there uh, as well. So why did Kentucky join the Confederacy after the Civil War? Primarily, white Kentuckians felt betrayed by Abraham Lincoln and the federal government's policies during the war and Reconstruction. For example, in 1864, General Stephen Burbridge, the general who was in charge of Union forces at Kentucky, issued something called Order 59, which called for the execution of four Confederate guerrilla prisoners for every Union soldier uh, killed. And we see this, um, uh, 
anger that Kentuckians felt about Burbage's order in these Confederate monuments. And this is, these are interesting. They're known as martyr monuments. If I remember correctly, there are about three of them. And so for these soldiers that were executed by the Union soldiers, these communities uh, erected them. Uh, this is a monument in uh, Henry County. I think it's uh, dedicated to about four soldiers who were killed. And this is another martyr monument. This is in uh, Jefferson County. Uh, and just to kind of give you um, a little bit of an idea here of the inscription and how they uh, turn these folks into to martyrs. Uh, this is the this is on the um, on the, uh, the gravestone here in Jefferson Town. The inscription reads: "Robbed of the glory of death on the field of battle by Stephen G. Burbridge, who ordered them shot without cause or trial, erected to the memory of four martyrs by the Sidney Johnston Chapter of the United Daughters of Confederacy of Louisville in uh, June of 1904." Neo-Confederates argue that removing Confederate statues, whether they offend our modern moral sensibilities or not, is tantamount to erasing history. This argument is ahistorical and hides the fact that many Americans at the time had deep misgivings about erecting Confederate monuments. In 1878, the Cincinnati Gazette wryly commented on John Breckinridge's statue here. This is when it was erected in 1878. The Cincinnati Gazette said, quote, as an early secession conspirator, and a Confederate soldier, statesman, and man, he is probably as statuable as any Confederate. But it goes on to say, what shall be the moral to young Kentuckians, end quote. Monuments are not clear and accurate representations of history, and therefore, they should not be viewed as permanent. Indeed, they have their own histories to study. Moreover, monumental sculptures should speak to, to borrow a phrase from Abraham Lincoln, the better angels of our nature. Removing Confederate monuments from public spaces won't erase history, but it will erase the political work of white supremacy. Instead of using public spaces to sanctify slavery and treason, we need to use these arenas to properly contextualize the past and to create new opportunities for more accurate and inclusive versions of American history. Now, another um, example of a Civil War monument that we might find in Kentucky this is interesting, and I think it's only, uh, this is one of two. This is a monument dedicated to both Union soldiers and Confederate soldiers, and it's located in um, Covington, uh, Kentucky. But even though, even though it's dedicated to both sides, the name of it uh, just shows you how strong this, this uh, lost cause mythology is. The name of it is the War Between the States Veterans Memorial. <laughs> And war between the states, that is a phrase for the Civil War that uh, Confederates, former Confederates created at the end of the war. So even a monument that's dedicated to both sides still has this, uh, this, you know, this veneer of uh, the lost cause mythology connected to it. Thank you, Ben. That is super helpful. Um, can I ask you to just give us a little more background about the phrase lost cause so we know when we refer to that what we're talking about? Let me, uh, oh. There we go. Stop sharing there. Thank you. Can you say more about the, the idea of the lost cause mythology and what that stands for? So, so we know when we refer to that, what that means again. Yeah. So when you think about the lost cause mythology, um, think of it as essentially was this interpretation that uh, former Confederates and their sympathizers created uh, really kind of almost at, almost immediately at the end of the war as a way to explain you know why the war happened, why the South lost the war. Uh, kind of why it had to go through reconstruction and essentially why there had to be this kind of violent overthrow of congressional reconstruction uh, afterwards. So I, it, and it comes in all sorts of different uh, facets. I mean, it was you know, conveyed through pop culture, through politics, um, just all sorts, of, all sorts of mediums. So it's kind of a way that Southerners and their sympathizers came up with to explain the Civil War reconstruction. And so I guess you're suggesting here that the, the 
statuary we've been talking about really perpetuates the myth of the lost cause in a way and it props it up and, and gives it a kind of a solemn presence. Is that fair? Would you agree with that, Julia? Yeah, I think um, solemnity is a good word to talk about maybe because as I, as I said in the beginning of my talk, we either are hyper aware of art in public spaces because we're accosted by it, confronted by it, we like it or we don't like it, or it's so ubiquitous that it just kind of blends into the background. And I think that both of those things, maybe the ubiquity is a little dangerous too, because then you're not really questioning the presence there, right? You're just seeing it as, you know, kind of this, this solemn work. You don't really care who it is. You don't really care what it's about. You just know that you pass it on your way to get a coffee every morning. Um, and so I, I liked what uh, Ben said about, um, you know, the, uh, removal from public spaces, how that, you know, kind of depoliticizes these works. It takes them out of the context of, of white supremacy in which they were created and, and um, put into place and then allows us to continue to think about the history of the monument as well. Yeah, so kind of, kind of think of it like this. I mean, the, the building of the monuments is kind of one aspect. It's one part of, cre of creating this lost cause mythology. So kind of think of it as it has this sort of pseudo intellectual kind of academic element to it as well. You have a guy named William Dunning um, during this period, the early 20th century or so. He wasn't, a, Dunning was not a Southerner. I mean, he taught at Columbia University, but he basically read all of this uh, lost cause uh, literature. Uh, you know, Jefferson Davis at the end of the war, he writes these two big volumes about the about the Confederacy and he kind of revisions, you know, the, the war wasn't really about slavery. It was about uh, states, states rights. Uh, There's a guy named Edward Pollard. He was a journalist. He wrote a book called The Lost Cause. And that's where we actually get that phrase from. And he made the argument that the North and the South were kind of like two different civilizations. <laughs> and, you know, that slavery was, uh, you know, this benevolent. Christianizing uh, institution. And so you have Dunning, who's basically reading all of this literature written by these pro Confederates, and he just kind of swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. And so in his academic work, he basically makes this argument that, you know, Reconstruction was this, you know, horrible, oppressive process that white Southerners had to had to go through. And that African Americans were essentially were, you know, unfit for uh, democracy. And so kind of imagine that you've got this guy who's training generation after generation of PhDs, and what do they do? They spread this uh, mythology as well. I mean, it wasn't just something that was Southern. I mean, we could have gone to, you know, uh, schools in the North and seen this lost cause mythology being, being taught. As you describe those elements, they ring a bell to me. I still hear people say those same things. Uh, so the the lost cause mythology is still alive and well. I, I guess um, you draw a distinction in, in your initial remarks about uh, about history, what history is, and the difference between monuments and history. And you made the comment uh, about uh, the victors writing the history. And I guess what's it's interesting because uh, both of you are experts in the history, and you're sort of telling us this is this is the relevant um, set of uh, considerations and, and the right context to understand these things and where they came from. You're, you're trying to give us the, we might say, the real history or the uh, unvarnished history. Um, so I'm kind of curious to know, um, you mentioned this, Ben, in, in your uh, comments, if you could just kind of both respond to the idea that people often say, by removing a public monument that's been in place for a long time, we are uh, changing or revising or um, erasing history. I know you mentioned that uh, that argument a little bit, but I wondered if you could just both respond briefly, because that's a common thing that we hear in these debates. Well, I'll just say broadly that um, monuments are sites of memory, right, as well as history. So for something to be a site of memory or where memory and memorial commemoration is taking place, that's very different from a straightforward historical context, because the the memory the memorial aspect of it can change from generation to generation it can be strengthened it can be watered down right so so as a site of memory or as an object that um, provokes a certain kind of memorial quality i think monuments are 
historical and beyond. They're both historical and then they're more than that. Um, in terms of the removal, right, that's the big question. That's the big question in art history. It's it's a question that architectural historians are talking about as well because it changes the spaces that we occupy and the spaces that we're so familiar with. Um, I brought in the Teddy Roosevelt equestrian statue because that was um, it's not that it was an unsolicited response, but it was a it was a statue that wasn't really at the forefront of controversy. And yet the Museum of Natural History made this very public decision and public announcement and had a very public removal. Actually, sometimes they remove these things in the middle of the night. Sometimes they remove these things in the middle of the day. That one happened to take place with, you know, a kind of a crowd there to see it happening. Um, and I, I would say in that case, it's not a it's not a rewriting of history, but rather a removal of that that kind of celebratory act um you know that that statue stood at the entrance many of these statues stand in public squares they stand next to our courthouses they stand next to our institutions and they they kind of lend that sense of authority or solemnity to the space and so i think by that very public removal it was a step in the right direction it doesn't erase or destroy the work and in fact the sculpture itself has certain qualities as you know as a work in bronze that are are valid and worth um worth remembering but it it's the it's the placement that that creates that tension i think and so the question i raised is are we going to just melt them all down well no i don't want to melt them all down and i don't want to see you know new weapons or whatever we don't have bronze weapons anymore but i don't want to see these things repurposed um i want to i want us to continue to learn from them i just want us to maybe rethink the context of of their location and rethink the audience and how an audience can respond to them yeah, I suppose that the way that I, I view monuments is almost like they are uh, a slice of history. They're a piece of history, but they're certainly not um, the whole story. It's like whenever students go out and they watch a movie, they'll come and they'll ask me, is this historically accurate? And I'm like, uh, you know, there could be parts and pieces of it that, but you don't swallow the whole thing here, right? I mean, you have to ask questions about it. And the same thing applies uh, to monuments. I guess that the, the, the thing is, is that if we are going to put these up in public spaces, they should, as I say, speak to the better angels of our nature. I'm not sure what better angel of our nature, you know, the Confederacy and Robert E. Lee, they don't speak to that. Uh, and so these monuments should say something um, about our, our national character, about our vision for the future of the country, particularly, you know, since we're this we pride ourselves on being this, you know, laboratory of, of democracy and equality. I, I think that public monuments need to, in some way, speak to that. But even when we do that, we have to be uh, we have to be careful and ask questions. So uh, I suppose for me, it's about uh, putting these things into into context. And uh, Julia mentioned the emancip uh, the Emancipation Monument um, by Thomas Ball and why it's so you know, controversial. It got me to thinking, you know, if you look within um, Civil War uh, historiography and African American historiography, there's this huge debate, you know, did Lincoln free the slaves or did slaves free themselves? And if you look at the experience in Kentucky, I mean, you've got, I think it's like uh, 24,000 uh, African American uh, men joined uh, the Union Army, uh, and most of them were, were slaves. And that's a that's a huge that's a huge number. I think only Louisiana contributed uh, contributed more. So when you look at you know, African American and men, I mean, they're just you know, they're running away from their from their masters. They're you know running to uh, Camp Nelson and joining the Union Army. And they're fighting. So yeah, I mean this statue doesn't quite get at uh, what emancipation uh, was. It certainly tells us you know in the minds of you know uh, you know late. Uh, 1800 Americans, you know, what they thought about emancipation, but it doesn't kind of speak to the whole picture. And so and we need to be sure to, I guess, put these types of public monuments into the proper context. That is really helpful. So, so what I hear you both saying is that it's the, the function and the context of the monuments that is crucial, right? So, um, and, and Ben, you repeated that phrase that uh, public monuments should sort of speak to our higher angels and kind of draw out the Parts of us we want to strengthen and encourage and recognize. 
Um, this leads me to a question about the nature of the meaning of a, of a, a work of art or a symbol or something. Um, and you hear it in connection with debates about displaying the Confederate flag. Um, some people say the flag is not about slavery. It's about, you know, um, it's about other values that we that we that I do want to celebrate. It's about tradition and heritage and loyalty and bravery. Um, and in a sense, what they're saying is that some of these things are speaking to what they what they think of as our higher angels, but they don't speak to everybody's higher angels, maybe. And so um, this makes me wonder, you know, about the the criterion we use in terms of whether to keep displaying a monument as a monument and, and who decides uh, which uh, angels should be encouraged and which should be discouraged. And, and I wonder if you could say something about that and maybe about the idea of uh, the meaning of a thing like a like a flag or a, or a monument. Uh, is the meaning up to everyone's interpretation or does the historical uh, uh, origin of the thing really play a central role in, in uh, fixing what the meaning of the thing is? Do you have any? Thoughts about those things. I suppose that you know, if some guy wants to put the Confederate flag on his, you know, have his little Confederate flag on his uh, car, you know, the license plate or whatever, you know, um, I, I don't have a problem with, with that. If he wants to tack the Confederate flag up in his garage, uh, that's okay. If he wants to get the Confederate flag uh, tattooed, I'm cool with that as well. The problem is. is public space. This is our space. And so it should be our public memory. Uh, once again, I mean, I suppose we could say that the Confederates were fighting for their civilization. They were fighting for their version of uh, of the Constitution, American history. I mean, they do kind of see themselves as, you know, we're kind of like George Washington here. I mean, they have this, they have this interpretation. But that idea of freedom and equality that they have was based on enslaving people of color. And you can't you can't disconnect these two things. I mean, you can you can, you know, pretend like they don't exist, but once you start digging into the history, you realize that that equality, right, is based on enslavement. And so you know, putting that up in public space, I mean, that just seems the, the wrong message. So my thinking on this is, is, as an art historian, this is a major question and it's something my students ask all the time. It's, is my interpretation valid? You know, um, uh, what, do, what did the artist mean? What's his or her intention? And the intention is always sometimes so difficult to get at. Um, one of the ways that that I, I tell my students to think about this is uh, there's an art historian named Michael Baxendahl who worked on the Renaissance and he developed a concept called the period I, which means you have your perspective. We're coming from the 21st century, right? We're here in, in uh, Kentucky in 2021 and that's going to shape our, our outlook of things. Um, at the time of its creation, the work of art was understood in a different way. And the way that you understand the period I is by understanding what iconographic symbols, what um, what societal standards and systems, what religious symbols were in place at that time. And so you can better understand, you know, how an original audience would respond to it. And I think with regard to symbols like the Confederate flag, I think there's some folks would see it as absolutely benign and some folks would see it as absolutely cancerous. And um, if you go back with your period eye and you think about the development of that symbol and what it represented to those people at that time, that symbol meant a different thing than, than it did in the 1950s when um, you know, the KKK was flying it at their gatherings, and it means something different, you know, now because of the context of America in 2021 and what we've all been through in the last year. If I see this again now, I'm going to have a different response to it. So there's kind of a, a historic, historic, historical way of looking. I, I'm going to skip that long word I was trying to say. There's a historical way of looking or way of seeing that you have to keep in mind with these. And um, if you go back to the equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius, the reason it stayed around is because they thought 
after, you know, 100 years or so, hundreds of years after it was um, created, uh, the Middle Ages, uh, the medieval uh, Italians believed that it was an image of Emperor Constantine, and they love him because he legalized Christianity and found it, you know, laid the foundation for a Christian Western Europe, and so they kept it around all those years, and, and really that's why we have it today. So there's just these ways of seeing that are tied to historical moments, and I think that's really important to keep in mind in the discussion. That's a really revealing example because in, in one sense, the popularity of the statue is due to a mistake about the history, what it depicted and where it came from. Um, I can't help but think of um, uh, recent events in which national symbols have been attacked by people and, and think about uh, what, what they, how they interpret those symbols and why they deserve to be attacked. It's a really interesting idea that thinking about it as a episodic that way. And also, How should we think about the decision to uh, remove a monument uh, and, and what sort of factors should play into that consideration? We've talked briefly about the fact that public spaces represent our values and not just some, some of us, but everybody. Um, do you have any thoughts about, about the process or the, the, the procedure there that people should be thinking about this when they imagine their local monuments and think about what they represent? and who should make that decision? Do you have any suggestions about that? I, I suppose that, um, once again, kind of thinking about, you know, understanding the history behind construction of these monuments. I mean, what I'm, what I'm thinking about here specifically uh, isn't necessarily monuments, but it's, uh, we also see this in schools, for example. I mean, and this is kind of a part of this lost cause mythology. and. I'm thinking about particularly in the lower south where you find high schools and middle schools that are named after uh, Confederate generals. You know, Jeb, I think there's a Jeb Stewart uh, Middle School in Jacksonville, uh, Florida, where I used to where I used to live. Uh, and and who goes to that school? It's you know 70% African American students. Now, why would why would anyone want to have a school with such a high population of African American students? You know, named after a Confederate. I mean, that's just, you know, these schools, their names were probably changed uh, after 1954, after Brown versus Board. It was kind of a way to say, okay, so you want to integrate? Great. Your kids are going to go to Jib Stewart uh, uh, Middle School, right? I mean, and it's, it's basically kind of like a poke in the eye. So, once again, we have to kind of understand, you know, why, uh, why these monuments are there, why schools are named a certain way, and kind of to put that history behind it and kind of understand you know, why that happened. And I mean, I think that's a uh, gets us a, a better understanding of whether these monuments should remain, where the schools should uh, keep these names and so on. And so, so we kind of have to do that kind of background. And I'm going to bring up this very contemporary idea of cancel culture. And I'm going to say that the uh, removal of these monuments, um, you know, I really want to warn against people lumping this into this idea of cancel culture, which I think is a very kind of negative uh, concept. Um, but I would say that the removal of a Confederate monument from a town square, for example, the removal of the monuments that were in Lexington, so Morgan and Breckenridge, the statues were there in Lexington. Um, if it comes from a, a kind of grassroots public outcry that says this this makes us feel uncomfortable in our own city, in our own space, then I think that they have the right to be heard and that that's a valid reason for the removal of such a thing. And I think if it comes internally from a space like the Museum of Natural History deciding this is not what we want in our very public, you know, entrance way, this is not the face we want to put forward, we're challenging our own institution, then, then that's fine as well, and it should be removed. Um, I like the idea of um, removing two cemeteries and places like that, because even though they're public spaces, they're also spaces that are explicitly for memory and commemoration. Um, and I like the idea of, you know, recontextualizing through history and through the history of art, uh, what these monuments meant and what they, you know, meant throughout these different periods of time. Um, and, and, you know, keeping that context and that conversation uh, going so that, you know, of course, we're not trying to erase a moment in history or pretend that it didn't happen. Yeah, too often I think people 
tend to have this idea of, oh, if you're just going to, if you're going to remove the statue somehow, it's just going to like disappear. You're just going to mothball it or something. And no, it, I mean, it deserves to be put in a museum. It needs to be put in its proper context. I mean, you can have a great, uh, you know, talk, a great conversation about some of these statues and how they came to be and the, the meaning around them. Um, so, I mean, it's not as if, you know, just talking about you know, getting rid of these statues completely and, and not talking about, not talking about history. Uh, the goal basically is to contextualize it you know, in a good academic uh, way. This points us in the direction of the importance of education, of course, uh, understanding the context, understanding the history. And uh, we really appreciate the role that both of you play here at the university in helping to educate our students. and. And today also joining me for this conversation so we can also uh, appeal to a larger audience. So I really want to thank both of you for joining me for this conversation. There's so many interesting um, questions we could keep pursuing here. Uh, we could go on for a long time and, and go off in so many interesting directions. So it's been really helpful. I want to thank you both for your expertise and your time and uh, hope to see you again on another uh, edition of the Colorado Conversations. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.